Davidson. I'm Mike King. We welcome you to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Hall of Fame Museum in this edition of Indy 500, The Classics. Donald, certainly there are a lot of popular displays here in this building, none more so, though, than the A.J. Foyt display. A lot of legends connected with this track, none larger than this one. A.J. Foyt, of course, was going to win the 500 four times, but the time he drove this car in 1961 as the defending national champion, he hadn't won the 500 yet. Well, let's take a look at qualifying for the 1961 Indianapolis 500. The 1st of May signals the start of activities, which climaxes in the famous Memorial Day Classic. Drivers and crewmen arrive from all parts of the country, for Indianapolis is the mecca of the racing fraternity. Now begins a time of testing, experimenting, and retraining. Cars are towed to the pit area, ready for their first easy laps around the track. The tempo begins to pick up. A feeling of expectation and excitement hangs in the air. And with the approach of the half-century mark, the realization of a dream lies within reach. The much sought after speed of 150 miles per hour. In 1960, a rookie named Jim Hurtabies astounds the racing world by qualifying within a split second of the 150 mile per hour mark. Veteran driver and former national champion Tony Bettenhausen accepts the challenge laid down the year before. He tests his new car at a speed of 149.2 miles per hour, just a whisker away from Hurtabies' record. This sets the pace and the search for speed begins. Rookie drivers make their first runs under the watchful eyes of USAC officials. Older drivers counsel them about the four tricky corners, puzzles that several generations of racers have tried to solve. Testing continues. Speeds mount higher and higher. And Russ Condon discovers that the wall on turn four is very hard indeed. Tinglestad, in his search for speed, loses control for one split second, and turn four begins to look like a giant tic-tac-toe game. The racing world gets a jolt when John Cooper of England brings his light rear-engine car to the speedway. In early test, Jack Bravo, world road racing champion, drives the Coventry Climax-powered car around the Indianapolis track with ease. Speeds of 144 miles per hour are attained, and the car shows superior cornering ability. Chief Stewart Harlan Fingler gives John Cooper a list of do's and don'ts, among which is a helpful hint about being sure the wheels are on tight. On turn four again, Dwayne Carter, losing a wheel, spins helplessly down the track as Don Freeland does everything but stand his car on end to avoid collision. Cars are like individuals, and each one has its peculiarities. Another rookie's in trouble. Roger McCluskey woefully inspects his damaged car, and perhaps thinks about some other profession. Real tragedy strikes. He was testing a car for a friend. They found a nut in one turn, a bolt in another, and farther on, part of the car. Tony Bettenhausen was a champion. He had more experience than almost any man on the track. A man loved and respected by his closest competitors. His career ended here, just across from the entrance to Gasoline Alley. The ribbon is cut, and the track officially opens for qualification. 
Bill Cheeseburg drives out of the pits and starts his run. But the dream of a 150 mile per hour lap is gone. Cheeseburg turns a respectable 145.873 average for his 10 mile qualifying run. He pulls in, happy that his ordeal is over. Then Eddie Sachs, last year's pole winner, takes off. A confident wave and he hits the bricks. A smooth and quick four laps around the track earns him the checkered flag. The speed, 147.418 miles per hour. In the pits he gives the we're in signal and Sachs has won the coveted pole position for the second straight year. A.J. Foyt, the national champion, pulls in. His run puts him in the pole position of the third row. Chief mechanic George Vignati begins to get a feeling that Foyt's winning streak will continue. And Jim Hurtabies qualifies for his second race at Indianapolis, winning the outside spot in the front row. Roger Ward is no stranger to the speedway. He won the 1959 race, placed second in 1960. Officials and drivers wonder if Ward will come back for a second win this year. His qualifying speed puts him way up front, pole man of the second row. But qualifying has its problems for some drivers. Rookie Don Davis spins, recovers, and drives it away. Veterans have their problems too. Seattle driver Jack Turner spins on turn two, makes a nice recovery and goes back for seconds. Master mechanic Smokey Eunuch puts the starter to last year's winning car. On the throttle, the man who drove it to his first Indianapolis win, Jim Rathman of Miami, Florida. He starts a run which assures him a solid position in the lineup as race fans are busy trying to watch all the action. But on Sunday morning, Chuck Arnold has no time for scenery. He's real busy. Nobody hurt, everything okay down in turn one. And Don Freeland allows them enough time to clean things up before he brings a new sensation to qualifying. Now the car is ready to qualify. Jimmy Daywalt wheels out of the pits, onto the track, to drive the four laps which constitute his qualifying run. One hundred forty-four point two one nine miles per hour. Daywalt wins a starting position in the fastest field of cars the Speedway has ever seen. And then, it rained. Qualifying slowed up. But a magic moment of perfect track conditions arrives for Lloyd Ruby. He starts out to qualify the car that Tony Bettenhausen would have driven. He takes the turns with ease and crosses the finish line with a blistering average of almost 147 miles per hour. And so the field was filled, and the bumping began. Happiness for those crewmen and drivers who made it. Surprise, elation, and a case of jitters for rookies about to drive their first big one.
So the cars were ready to run the 1961 Indianapolis 500 and rather unusual at the time there were three former winners, Troy Rutman, Jim Rathman and Roger Ward and a very highly touted rookie named Parnelli Jones who a lot of people thought had a serious chance to win. Time now to drop the green flag on the 1961 running of the Indianapolis 500. starters. Sachs on the pole. Don Branson in the middle. Hernabee's on the outside. Ward in the second row. Rookie Parnelli Jones next to him and Dick Rathman beside them. Then comes Foyt, Sutton, Cheeseburg, Johnson, Jim Rathman and Weiler and others behind them. The fastest field in history and each man a potential winner. Words alone cannot describe the start. Just listen. Sachs leads from the pole, but Jim Hurtabies goes faster and faster, passes Sachs on the outside, and slowly builds up his lead. The field strings out. and leads the race, burnt valve sidelining the car. Bobby Grimm in the Thompson Industries Special goes out with a burnt piston. Then Jim Hurtaby sacrifices his lead to make his first pit stop. He's won over $5,000 in lap prize money, but 21 seconds here brings an end to his winning streak. Nineteen sixty winner Jim Rathman moves into the lead and starts to press his advantage. On the 43rd lap, Rathman is forced to come in for tires and fuel, and the lead passes to rookie Parnelli Jones. Now the pit stops come fast and furious. Bill Cheeseburg brings his Dean Van Lines car in for service after driving in the top 10 all the way. Roger Ward comes in, signaling for quick attention. A few laps later, Parnelli Jones is out of first place, joining the others in the pits. Sachs sacrifices the lead, rolling into the pits. His well-trained crew moves into action. High-pressure tanks on the scene can ramrod 55 gallons of mobile fuel into thirsty tanks in a little over 12 seconds. Sachs pulls away. Pandemonium breaks loose in the main straightaway. A ruptured oil tank on the car driven by Don Davis. A chain of accidents is triggered by his skidding car. The 
The main straightaway resembles a large bowling alley where cars lie scattered like ten pins. Six cars are involved. Shocked emergency crews rush to the scene. An accident of this magnitude never expected. Turner's car wrecked after flipping high in the air. McCluskey's car wrecked after hitting Cheeseburg's. Shepard's car wrecked. And Ruby stopped at the beginning of turn one after barely getting through. A miracle indeed. Destruction for the cars, no injuries to the drivers. Under the caution flag, the depleted field slows down, threading gingerly among the wrecked cars. Emergency crews clear the track. Lynn Sutton spins on the slick surface, narrowly missing another calamity. Now Jim Rathman is out of the race. He stands on the pit wall looking for a ride. Parnelli Jones in the pits with a cut on his face, broken goggles, and a motor that won't run right. Perdabies makes his pit stop, starts out. But something's wrong, there's a fire in the cockpit. The crew works on the stubborn blaze as the rest of the field passes by. With the fire out, Hurtabies jumps back in and goes out for more. A.J. Foyt leads. And there's a rabbit running against the traffic in turn three. But trouble is not through with Jim Hurtabies. His engine blows up. In racing vernacular, he ventilated it. He brings it safely to a stop in the turn one infield. Now, a battle for the lead, which will make racing history begin. Point leads, with Sachs breathing down his neck. Len Sutton, out of competition, watches the raging battle. Eddie Johnson leaves the race abruptly in turn four. Jack Beckley stands on the track wall, wildly signaling Wayne Weiler that his left front wheel is about to come off. Eddie Sachs now leads. He just went that away. Down in the pits, Eddie's wife listens carefully to the race announcer. Tension builds, and then Sachs comes in for his third in what should be his last pit stop. Once again, the crew swings into action as the critical seconds tick away. Finished and rolling out, Eddie is cheered on his way. From here to the finish, it's a rough, hard drive. A.J. Foyt pulls in two laps later. His crew jumps to their task. They have a winning car and driver on their hands, but still the race could be lost here and now. Something is wrong. The automatic fueling device will not engage, and while tires are replaced, he's not getting the precious fuel needed to finish the race. The air jacks drop the car, the hose disengages, and Foyt is away with no fuel. A panic-stricken crew mills helplessly around, wondering what they should do. Foyt still doesn't know he's traveling light. Roger Ward takes advantage of the two pit stops. Now he has the lead. But Foyt, with his light fuel load, is burning up the track with a sizzling 146 miles per hour. The crew watches anxiously, and suddenly Sachs is back in front. Foyt is back in the pits for the forgotten fuel load, and the race is almost won for Sachs. He has only to maintain his position to make it across the finish line first. A competitive crewman watches him fly by. Suddenly, the crowd is on its feet. 
three laps to go, and Sachs is making a pit stop. One worn tire and his refusal to gamble on it puts Foyt back into the lead. Sachs storms out of the pits, but it's all over. Foyt crosses the finish line. A.J. Foyt, a true champion in every respect. Winner of the half-century Indianapolis 500, the richest, most colorful race in the world. A disappointed Sachs pulls in slowly. Ward gets the OK sign for third place. And for A.J. Foyt, a trip to victory lane. A rookie in 1958 and a winner in 1961. A new track record of 139.131 miles per hour and the largest purse in all Speedway history. So A.J. Foyt was in victory lane at Indianapolis in 1961 at the age of 26. And he would be back again and again and again. Certainly on that May Day here at the Brickyard, a legend was born. For Donald Davidson, I'm Mike King. Thanks for being with us for this edition of Indy 500, The Classic.